we want to talk about coronavirus vaccines. And by we, I mean Kevin and I. Here's me getting the vaccine. I think they're great. But Kevin thinks they're a terrible idea. I think it's a microchip. You've been acting really strange lately. I fly that Kevin just started medical school and has a lot to learn. But I get it. It's really complicated. I trust all of you guys to explain to me how this computer works and that my cell phone doesn't make Oreos in the middle of the night. So I'm going to pay you back by importing the knowledge that I know about immunology so that you can make a truly informed decision about what's better for you, risking getting the coronavirus or risking the vaccine. Don't believe her. It's a 5G microchip. Oh, Kevin, I love you anyway. Look at my arm here. You can see that it got a little red and a little sore from the Pfizer vaccine. For reference, here's my smallpox vaccine from 1967. Ew, that's gross. Here's how it works. The vaccine copies how the immune system protects you from the virus from infecting your cells. Oh, so we have to understand the cells and the virus and the immune system in order to understand how vaccines work. Excuse me, but that sounds so boring. We're gonna use my house as an example of a cell. So this is the outside of a house, the outside of a lung cell, inside of the house, inside of a lung cell. My favorite room, the library, which is basically like the nucleus of the cell. It contains all of the information for everything, just like the DNA of the cell. I'm looking for a specific recipe, so I find the book of bread, and I open it to the page I need, and I find the pita recipe. That's like a gene for a particular protein. Now that I have a copy of the recipe, which is the messenger RNA or the mRNA, it's a copy of the recipe that we found on the DNA, we're going to take it to the kitchen and bring it to our cooks, oh. hey. otherwise known as ribosomes. Alrighty there, let's see what we got. He's so cool. Oh, what you done? I want to be a ribosome. That's okay, Kevin. You can be a ribosome, but you have to understand the kind of proteins you're going to make, like collagen for your skin or the hemoglobin that helps the blood carry the oxygen around, keratin for your hair, or even insulin to prevent diabetes. So back to our friendly ribosomes cooking away whatever protein it is that they're cooking. Once the protein is formed, little samples of it need to end up on the outside of the cell or basically outside of the house. And that way, everybody knows what's going on inside of every cell. This display window on the outside of the cell is known as the MHC, or Major Histocompatibility Complex. Now that we know a little bit about cells, well then how do viruses take over the cell's protein factory into just making viruses? Here's an example of a virus. We call them rhinovirus. But there are lots of different kinds of viruses that can affect you, and they're all different shapes like rabies, herpes, adenovirus, Ebola, coronavirus, and they all are desperately trying to get into the cell. So here's where antivirus sees a glucose going through the glucose receptor. The sugar basically just knocks on its special little window, window opens up, and it goes right in. He tries the exact same window, no go pushes, shoves. I had to bleep out the swear words there. And now he's getting desperate. Are there any parts of him that can help him to sneak in? Turns out it's his fuzzy little tail. And once he discovers the special door, the doggy door, he goes right in. Oh no, I'm really scared now. It is kind of scary. We just saw how the rhinovirus can use this fuzzy little tail to get in from the doggy door. The coronavirus uses something called a spike protein to get through an ACE receptor or an ACE door. Not everybody has that many ACE receptors. So if you have diabetes, hypertension, you're overweight, you're more likely to have these ACE receptors on your lung cells. And so the coronavirus is going to make you sicker. Anyway, the coronavirus latches onto the ACE receptor and gets into the cell and goes straight to the ribosome protein factory and takes over and turns the cell into a virus making factory. So the rhinovirus gets in and literally is handing out recipes of how to make him. 
his rhinovirus ear and mouth and fuzzy tail that have to go to the kitchen. All right, and ear. And our hard-working ribosomes start making rhinovirus ears, rhinovirus mouths, rhinovirus fuzzy tails, which are like the spike protein for the coronavirus. And all of these get displayed on the MHC outside. The ah, why do you keep mentioning that MHC? It's so confusing. What's the point of that thing? The MHC is a display window to what is going on inside the cell. So now that we're displaying virus parts, this can be picked up as an early warning that there is an intruder or a virus inside the cell and the immune system can start fighting it. It's kind of like a smoke alarm calling the fire department before the house is completely engulfed in flames. While we've been talking, there's still more rhinovirus getting made. It's completely taken over the house now. Now he's spreading to the neighboring houses through their ACE receptors or doggy doors. Now he's taking over the whole city. And between him and the immune system fighting, you start to get this picture. Oh, okay. Well, so we did cells and then viruses, and now we're going to do the immune system? You have an immune system in order to protect you from all foreign and domestic threats. But think of all the layers of defense that you and your house have on the mountain or in whatever ecosystem that you're in. First line of defense works against everything, sort of threat not otherwise specified, like your skin um, or your mask that you wear, or like this wall doesn't let things in. You can swat it, you can spray it. Um, but if something gets in and you're really fighting it, it can look pretty bad. Imagine with all the fighting and water spraying and machine guns and tear gas, Regardless of whether you win or the virus or the invader wins, things can look pretty ugly in there and you can end up looking like this. Excuse me, Ember has a really important question. Kevin, who's Ember? Oh, you met Ember. She was with me in entomology class and now we go together to Insects Anonymous because we have challenges not eating bugs. Um, but she's so hot because of her uh, heat lamp. Ow, what was that for? <laughs> heat lamp. What's your question, Ember? Well, so the virus got in and we fought it off. How do we prevent it from ever hurting us again? Is there a way to remember what happened and never forget and always be prepared? So yeah, all those analogies that we've been talking about and that you've been taught before, the weapons of the immune system, the blunt tools, the swatting, the spraying with a fire hose, spraying with a machine gun, paratroopers, army, navy, fighters, you name it. But the difficult part is to know when and where to use those weapons well wisely. How does your body build its intelligence system? Because clearly, in order to protect yourself, you have to know who yourself is. Your appearance, location, beliefs, past and present. Me, me, not me, 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 really not me, me. The things that are not yourself go into different categories. Your friends, they're welcome at any time. You can. What about me? Am I a friend? Of course you are, silly. Your enemies, you keep them at bay and attack on sight. Yikes! Your frenemies, con artists, hypocrites, old friends with new haircuts. These are all categories where it's a little bit of a gray zone. You have to kind of reserve judgment and you it, react depending on the circumstances. Wait, I know cats are evil, but that was Ember. I know, Kevin, but I just met her. I have to get to know her first. It's not that easy to figure out who to trust. It takes time and a lot of information. Think about it. You don't attack all the people outside your house, just the ones that caused a problem the last time you let them in, or those who unlawfully entered, or those who look suspicious, or the ones your friends warned you about. Your immune system is the ultimate profiler. You don't want to attack the wrong things. We see what happens when the immune system goes wrong. If you don't attack enemies, like infections, you die very, very early. Oh, that's so sad. If you attack yourself, you have an autoimmune disease. If you attack peanuts, you can have a fatal peanut allergic reaction. That looks painful. It's really complicated. But in summary, your immune system has to have a crystal clear sense of self. It's informed by intense and constant and detailed profiling of every single citizen or cell in your body. 
Nothing invented by humans comes within a million miles of the level of intelligence needed. And it is all done by your own cute little cells that work with a brilliant live learning system. Forget AI or machine learning. This stuff is crazier than science fiction. To understand any of this, we have to understand the concept of antigens. Oh no, is this hard? Don't worry, Kevin, I'll help you. You are definitely growing on me, Ember. There are trillions of things in our world that you might have to interact with over your lifetime. We call these things antigens. Each antigen can be described and identified and profiled, like an ID card with a unique face and signature and retina scan. That's fascinating! There are types of antigens. You have self antigens on your own cells. My self antigens are different from your self antigens. That's why organ transplants so hard. What about things like the viruses? There are bad antigens, things that break through the barriers and get into you, like the coronavirus and its spike protein. There are bad antigens that are developed in your own body, like cancer cells. Is that it? And then there are the confusing looking antigens that just look weird. Like, so my body might decide the peanut antigen is cool, but your body might decide that the peanut antigen is a criminal. All right, deep breath. This is the mind blowing part. Look out, because if you're an atheist, studying this part will convert you to the same unshakable belief in God that I have. Each of us is born with the ability to interact intelligently with every single possible antigen that you might see over your lifetime. Every single one. The interface that helps you to interact with the antigens, these are called lymphocytes, a type of white blood cell that works in your immune system. Every antigen has its lymphocyte. You are born with trillions of lymphocytes and at birth, they are undifferentiated blobs that look the same on the outside like a trillion white farm eggs. But on the inside, each carries a different seed, a code, the picture of the one specific antigen that they can react with. When they meet their antigen, their reaction depends on the how and where they meet. That's kind of unbelievable. Uh, wait guys, it gets better. Lymphocyte number 2354 has a code that matches my own personal eyeball. So my cerebrodron CIA surveillance tells it that it is self, stand down, and it becomes tolerant and never goes on the attack. Lymphocyte number 20984754478 has a code that matches polio virus. If polio enters me, my CIA surveillance sends the alert. It helps it to find the polio, tells it to attack. The lymphocyte takes a few days, but it eventually multiplies into a large colony. Wait, I know. Those yes, are the Kevin. antibodies. I think those are the antibodies. Guys, guys, settle down. Wait a second. Yes, those are antibodies. Look at them. They're going to attack the polio virus. They're going to attack the polio virus and chewed it all up. And then the trash guys came to pick it up and it's gone. Yes, guys. That's exactly what that adaptive immune system is that we were talking about. The lymphocyte that got stimulated, it made antibodies for now, but then left over a couple of lymphocytes that will always remember their memory lymphocytes. And if that polio virus ever showed up again, it'll instantly start the antibody factory and fight it. That was a lot. Let's go through with an example. Back to our friends. Here we have our surveillance guy, Mr. APC. He's kind of like the monitor who walks around the outside of the house and makes sure everything's okay. Of course, he has to stop and check in the MHC window. Yep, baker's house, pita bread. Okay. Shows up the next day, pita bread. Check. Then he's like, what on earth? is that. So Mr. APC grabs the antigen. Wait, why did you call him? What's an APC? So here's the polio virus. All those little dots are the antigens. Those antigens are going to show up on the outside of the cell the same way that the fuzzy tail showed up in the window. The antigen presenting cell is that monitor guy who grabs the antigen and tastes it, chews it up, says, that tastes weird, and carries it to the lymph node. And then it sends out signals for all the lymphocytes to show up, so hopefully it finds the right lymphocyte. Now, that's why your lymph nodes get all swollen when you get an infection. So where was I? Oh yeah, so Mr. APC grabs the antigen and runs over to the lymph node, otherwise known as the chicken coop. Hey, call everybody. 
There's an intruder. This is kind of part of like what it looks like, but you gotta call everybody. There's an emergency. You gotta send everybody. Now it turns out that only one of these chickens was born with the ability to recognize this fuzzy tail antigen. Every chicken can only recognize one type of antigen. And we don't know which one it is. So they walk around and they peck it and feel it and touch it and jump around and go crazy. And eventually, the one chicken that was destined, that was programmed before birth to recognize this one antigen, figures that out. And that's her, Miss Sworn Enemy of Rhinovirus Fuzzy Tail. She proceeds to turn into a weapons factory, antibodies, against only the fuzzy tail. And of course, she doesn't make eggs. She makes specific antibodies that can inactivate the fuzzy tail. So she makes little plastic baggies. When the bags latch onto the rhinovirus tail, uh, instead of him being able to just use fuzzy tail to get into the doggy door, it doesn't fit anymore. And now he's just wrapped up in antibodies, sitting outside the house, and the trash guys come and pick him up. What if it was a different antigen that got taken from the MHC and got taken into the lymph node? Well, then a different lymphocyte or different chicken would have uh, re recognized it and made a different kind of antibody. In this case, looks like it's Q-tips for the ear antigen. All right, so let me get this straight. Here's a lung cell. The pink dots are the coronavirus that just infected it. The cell's falling apart. It sends out help signals, and the cells show up, and they're swatting and spraying, and all hell's breaking loose. And then finally, the big kahuna shows up, and he actually takes a piece of the protein antigen and gobbles it up and takes it to the lymph node and once he gets to the lymph node he's like hey everybody come on who's got this guy who knows this guy and they all show up and then one of them is the right one and he gets activated and he swims back into the bloodstream and makes a billion antibodies and they swim all the way back to the lung cell and the antibodies latch onto the antigen and then the trash comes and picks them all up see sir i told you ember was really smart Wait, I'm not done. And then when they're done fighting the infection, a couple of those lymphocytes are like, I will never forget what happened. And they just walk around always looking again for that virus that if ever shows up, they're just gonna take it out. Okay, Kevin, you understand it all now? Right? Of course, I get it. I just don't understand what it's got to do with vaccines. How does a microchip prevent you from having an infection? There's no microchip. <sighs> we have a lot of work to do. Yay, we can talk about vaccines now. All right, so this coronavirus vaccine tracker from, uh, Ember, what are you doing? I'm so happy there are vaccines. I'm just on top of the world right now. She's so beautiful. A whole new world. <laughs> Settle down. I love vaccines too. Uh, but anyway, back to the coronavirus vaccine tracker. You can see here that only two vaccines are approved for full use. 67 vaccines are in clinical trials on humans. And there are at least 89 that haven't even been tested on humans yet. So there's a lot of work going on. So let's start with a weakened or attenuated virus. Here's a rhinovirus can barely function. His arm's fallen off. He can barely get in through the ACE receptor doggy door with his fuzzy tail, falling asleep, trying to hand out recipes to make some of his um, antigens. Not a lot of it's gonna end up in the ribosomes, but some will. Examples of these vaccines are the Sinovac and Sinopharm from China and the Bard Biotech from India. So let me tell you how it works. We're gonna immunize this statue. I stuck a little yellow lymph node under his left armpit there. Lab is on the left, cells on the right, lymph node is on the bottom. Okay, so we take the regular coronavirus. You can see there, the green is the genetic material, the pink lines are the spike proteins, and we make a weakened version of that. Maybe it doesn't know how to multiply anymore. Um, maybe it has less spike protein. And we take a bunch of that and bottle it up and stick it in the syringe, and that's the injection. That virus is gonna to attach to the ACE receptor the same way the normal coronavirus does, and that's how it gets into the cell. Once there, it releases its genetic material, mRNA or messenger RNA is formed, goes to the ribosomes, gets translated, and then the cell starts making spike proteins or whatever other antigen it wants to make. The APC or antigen presenting cell grabs it, takes it to the lymph node, the lymphocytes meet it, 
hopefully a couple of them are going to get excited and activated and then you get your antibodies and the memory cells are formed. The miserable shell of a virus has died off by now. It can't multiply. It can't actually make more virus or make you sick and now you have developed some sort of immunity against the virus should it try to come in again. So the fact that my arm might get a little sore, a little bit red, um, my lymph node might be a little enlarged, that's great. It means my immune system is actually preparing to fight this virus should it show up. That's so complicated. Why do we have to put the virus to go to the cell, to go to the ribosome, to make the protein? Why can't we just put the protein in? Actually, you can. That brings us to the second sort of vaccine, which is a protein-based vaccine. For example, the Novavax vaccine that was developed under Operation Warp Speed does use protein-based vaccine technology. The results are quite promising, and hopefully this will also be approved for emergency use soon. The way this works is, well, let's look at this diagram again. The lab's on the left, cells on the right, lymph node on the bottom. This time, what the lab makes is a synthetically sort of something that looks just like the spike proteins, and that is what gets injected into your arm. Once it gets into your tissues, it's sort of just floating around outside your cells, and the antigen-presenting cells, or the APCs, can grab it, take it to the lymph node, present it to the lymphocytes, and then get your immune response started that way. The difficulty with this sort of vaccine is that your immune cells have to know that there's a problem in order to go there and pick it up. So basically, we're like with a normal viral infection, there's like a dying cell, lots of first-line defense, you know, the fire hose, water spraying, all that stuff we talked about. There isn't any of that in this case. There's just this protein sitting there. So you have to mix it in with something that excites the immune cells. In this case, what's added is the extract from the soap bark tree, which is an ancient tree native to the Andes with a long history of use in traditional medicine. And it's that stuff that gets your immune system excited and gets it to react to the protein that just got injected. Ooh, organic is gonna make my skin all soft. Hey Kev, what are you doing? I'm looking for the 5G microchips. I can't find them. Yeah, they're not there. So given how complicated it is to make the first two sorts of vaccines, that's why there have been some new developments. These next two vaccines depend on getting your cell to actually make the spike protein and stick it outside your window on the cell on the MHC so that it can be recognized in the normal way. The first one we're talking about is the one that uses a viral vector. So instead of letting an entire weakened virus get into your cell, you wanna just let in the gene for the spike protein. To do that, you attach that to a virus that can easily get into your cell but can't actually hurt you or multiply. In this case, it's especially kind of neutered sort of adenovirus. The J&J vaccine that should be approved soon, the Gamalaya Sputnik vaccine from Russia, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine from the United Kingdom, they're all in this category. This video illustrates the idea. Here's the benign sort of neutered adenovirus vector. I mean, what could be more benign and likely to waltz right into my house in an Amazon box, right? Uh, anyway, it rings the bell, waltzes right in, heads toward the nucleus library. It can't really get in, but it empties its contents there. What have we here? Ah, a new recipe book. All it has, though, is the spike protein recipe. So we can copy that gene, i.e., you make the mRNA or messenger RNA, you take the mRNA to the waiting ribosomes in the kitchen, and they cook it up for us and make us a yummy fuzzy tail like spike protein that we can hang outside to get the immune process going. Here's our diagram. Lab on the left, cell on the right, lymph node on the bottom, and we're still injecting the statue. In the lab, we take the neutered adenovirus and splice into its genes, the gene for the coronavirus spike protein. And that's what we inject into the arm. The adenovirus easily enters the little cells in your shoulder area, and the genetic material is now in your cell. But the only gene that can be copied into the mRNA is the spike protein gene. The mRNA is made, it goes to the ribosomes, they make the spike protein, shows up on the cells MHC. The APC grabs some, takes it to the lymph node, presents it to the lymphocytes, and voila, you are now developing immunity to the spike protein of the coronavirus. If the virus shows up, the anti-spike protein antibodies will gum up the coronavirus and not let it enter from the ACE receptors, and now it can't hurt you. What? You're injecting a gene? That's uh, dangerous, isn't it? No, think about it. When the virus gets into your cell, 
all of the viral genes enter, all of them. And the viral genes are what are made into proteins and that's why you can make new viruses. Even that virus doesn't touch your own DNA or become a permanent part of your genes. In this case, it's a tiny fragment of the virus genes, just the spike protein one that gets in, is copied, and then goes away with those few cells. Wait, I know there's another one. This one, I got it here. The mRNA one. That stands for Microchip Right Now America. I know it. Yeah, no, Kevin, that's, that's not true. Let's talk about the mRNA vaccine. This is the one that's actually used in the United States right now. Pfizer and Moderna. Lab on the left, cell on the right, lymph node on the bottom. Here in the lab, they literally make copies of the recipe for the spike protein. They just make the mRNA, so it's not even a gene anymore. The problem is the mRNA is so delicate. Like if the gene is a book, the mRNA is like tissue paper. The challenge wasn't copying the mRNA. That part of the technology isn't new. The challenge was figuring out how to deliver the mRNA to the cell without it falling apart. So they figured out these amazing lipo nanoparticles. Um, it's like a special coating that protects the little mRNA strands and that helps it to dissolve directly into the cell membrane. It's amazing, but very, very delicate. You've all heard how it has to be stored super carefully at really cold temperatures in order not to go bad. So that's the stuff that's in the injection. There's the shot, it goes into the cell, the mRNA goes directly to the ribosome to be translated into spike proteins, and then you got it, goes to the MHC on the cell membrane, the APC takes the piece to the lymph node, presents it to the lymphocytes, which get activated, make anti-spike antibodies and memory cells. So here's a video. This is the mRNA wrapped up in its little fluffy coat. It gets onto the cell wall and dissolves right through, literally shows up right in the kitchen. The ribosome just gets that recipe and goes to work making the spike protein. Hangs it out on the wall outside. Mr. APC does his thing, takes the antigen, runs with it to the lymph node or the chicken coop, right? <laughs> Stimulates the lymphocytes. You make your antibodies and memory cells. Whoa! So there was no 5G and the mRNA is not even even the gene and it, it doesn't even go to my DNA or nothing. You got it, buddy. Mm. Can I have a vaccine? Uh, no. You're very low risk, Kevin. I'll let you know when it's your turn, okay? Okay. I'll wait to get mine when all the other kids get it. That's right. One day at a time. May God heal every patient and every heart. Amen.